So now we're doing our best today with, uh, with technology. Um, you can't see what I see, but there are cameras everywhere from my perspective. I'm not quite sure which one I'm supposed to be looking at. I'll pick that one. Great. So, brothers and sisters, it's absolutely wonderful that we can celebrate Mass together and that you, wherever you are and whenever you're watching this, that we're able to uh, attend Mass. Now, remember, we should always keep in mind, people have asked me about like, the value of spiritual communion or the value of watching Mass online. And, see, these kind of things are very hard to quantify. You can't weigh or measure grace. Okay, there's no... We can't quantify it in, in human terms, you know, like you get 4 kgs of grace if you go to Mass and you get 2 kgs if you watch it online and then if you watch it online the day after you want to get a kg of grace. I mean, it, it, does, it, just, it doesn't work that way. So I think what's helpful, rather than trying to quantify how much grace we get, is to keep in mind a very simple theological principle, okay, which is that God binds himself to his sacraments. God binds himself to his sacraments. So... If the Eucharist is validly confected, every host is entirely Jesus. If the priest validly ordained absolves sins, those sins are gone. Uh, so God binds himself to his sacraments, but God is not bound by his sacraments. God can work whatever way he wants. He can give grace whatever way he wants, whenever he wants, how he wants, if the hearts are open. So he's bound to his sacraments and he will and does work through them, but he can work other ways if he wishes. So we leave that up to him. So it's not, it's not up to me to try and measure, I don't know. How can, I mean, how can we quantify how much grace you get, what, where, and when? But the point being, we open our hearts to God and we say, Lord, give me as much as I'm capable of. Grant me as much as I'm capable of. So whenever or however we're watching this Mass, let's open our hearts to it. Like, let's open our hearts to the grace that Jesus offers us. That's what's important. One day I, I really hope and pray that we will be able to uh, attend Mass again, something which I feel is uh, beyond an essential service. It's a, it's, it's a super substantial service. It's like we were studying this in the Catechism during the week, the, 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 the Eucharist not just being our daily bread, but the literal translation of that is that it's our super substantial bread. It's like a substance and then it's like a super substance. Our, the Eucharist is our super substantial bread. We need it more than we need light, air, food. So, you know, for, it's beyond essential. Uh, I think that should need, and needs to be recognized in our state, but let's not get uh, diverted from the wonderful words of our reading today. Have you ever been to America? If you've been to America, one thing you will notice is that them boys over there are addicted to the American flag. They love it. It's everywhere. Right? It's, you just go through housing estates and it's like this American flag. They even have like special pole attachment things, which you see, so even if the flag isn't there, it could be put there at a moment's notice if it were required, you know? So like, they put flags everywhere. The more, it's like the American flag is everywhere. It's wonderful, it's great. I mean, if that's what you're into, go for it. It's no problem. But you, would, you can imagine like, if uh, someone were to spill his coffee, or make a, bit, make a bit of a mess on the porch. No one is going to take down the American flag and keep and, and clean up the mess with the flag. Okay? And it's not because you'll get shot, although it's actually probable in certain places, maybe, but it's not because there's some archaic law binding people to, to treat the flag with, with respect. It's simply the fact that they know instinctively this flag deserves respect. This flag deserves reverence. Okay, they can maybe, they know brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, whoever else uh, who has fought in the name of the flag or their forefathers have they're fought in the civil war and so on and so forth. Similarly in Ireland, we don't have quite as many as Irish, Irish flags all around the place, but the Irish flag, it represents something. Like, you know, if you were to see someone burn an Irish flag, even though you might consider yourself particularly patriotic, Somehow, I think it would stir up just a little something inside you, even though it's only three coloured sheets of material. But it represents something. You know it deserves reverence, because it represents something much, much greater. Today, in our reading, St. Paul is talking about uh, morality, promiscuity, all of these kind of things, where... He's calling the Ephesians to, to a much higher standard, a much higher kind of a, a, a way of speech. 
Okay? And he says that among you there must be not even a mention of fornication. For all of you wonderfully innocent people out there, fornication would be uh, intimate acts outside of marriage. Uh, so there should be not even a mention of fornication or impurity in any of its forms or promiscuity. This would hardly become of the saints. Not even a mention of it. I don't think there's anything else that's really spoken about, to be honest, in today's world. If you look at the news, if you look at social media, what gets hits, what gets clicks. Immodesty, impurity, body parts, that's, that's what people, people just delighted to see it. Click away, click read, watch, it's everything. It's, that's what's fueling uh, so much of social media. This is exactly the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing, right? Fornication, impurity, promiscuity, immodesty, all these kind of things. So, what is it then? What, what, what's a healthy attitude to have? The fact that we have reverence for the body in the same way that we have reverence for things, as, things much less important, like flags. We don't do so because there's a rule, some archaic law that, that, that obliges us to treat the body with respect. And we don't do it for, for, for the sake of rules. We do it because the body deserves reverence. The human being deserves reverence. They deserve respect. Again, not because we're prudish or we're embarrassed to talk about these things, but because they're, they're so sacred. They're good things. The human body is a good thing. It's given to us by God. It's, 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 it's amazing in so many ways. And it's, it's so beautiful in so many ways. But because of that, it, it deserves reverence. It's a, it's a gift given to us by God, our body. And because we don't talk about certain acts or things like that, it isn't because we're embarrassed by them, but because, again, they deserve reverence. You could imagine, I mean, if, if some man were to ever talk about the intimate acts he gets up to with his wife, I don't think anybody would say, oh, fair play to you. But like, lad, come on. Wife deserves more respect than that. Like, it just, it just, that's just, we, we kind of know instinctively, that's just unbecoming, like, of a noble heart. Just you don't talk about those things. Not, beca- not because they're bad. Um, hopefully they're not bad. But I mean, if they're just, yeah, we won't go into that either. But as long as they're not deviant acts. But it doesn't, like, intimate acts. Um, not because they're bad, but it's because they're, they're so sacred. This is a sacred thing. In God's eyes, it's a sacred thing. So it's because it's so good and sacred, it deserves reverence. Serves reverence. So we look at these things not, not that we're all embarrassed and uh, uh, prudish about them, but because they deserve such respect, such, such care, you know, that they're shown the reverence they deserve. So when, when St. Paul is speaking to us here, and he is speaking to us, these words ring 100% true for us today. I don't know what, look, I presume it's always been in the heart of man to, to speak about these things and to kind of laugh about them or or tell stories about different immodest or impure things that have happened. And St. Paul is calling out the Ephesians back 2,000 years ago on it. Guys, you're called to more. You're called to be saints. You're called to show reverence for this amazing body that you have and for these, these, this, this amazing participation in God's creative power that a married couple can engage in. And then he, he fin- the way the reading finishes today is just beautiful. Make sure that you are not included in any of these deceptive conversations. You were darkness once, but now you are light in the Lord. Be like children of light. You are light. What what an an amazing image. And and see, how how does light work? See, darkness doesn't exist. Darkness is just a lack of light. There's just, that's what makes dark dark. There's no light there. So we're not just called to be another shade of darkness, a kind of a lighter shade of darkness. We're called to be light. It's the antithesis, the opposite of darkness. And to bring that light where we go, wherever we are, whoever we're with. But that, you see, makes us different to the darkness. It makes us different. And as I've said so often here, like we've got to get used to that. In, in, in today's world, in today's modern Irish culture, we have to get used to being different. Because if we're the same as everyone else, unfortunately, the darkness that's out there will be just as dark as everything or everyone else and fall short of the glory that we're called to have before God by being light, 
by being his representatives, by being his apostles, by being his disciples in the world. So we have this amazing call to be different and to be light. And it's just it, the, the reaction of people to light will be varied. Some, when, they, when they're illuminated by the light, remember, keep in mind that the source of that light is the Lord, not you, but it, flows, it does flow through us. The reaction of some people to the light is, is fantastic, I can finally see the truth. And others are like, well, see these stains I can see now on myself? They're your fault, because you pointed them out. If it, wasn't, if it wasn't for you, I'd be running along blissfully with all these stains and not even know where you're at fault, because you're the light, you showed me. The false. And that's where the world is at today. It doesn't want the light. It doesn't want the light. You, what you're saying now, your you know, moral teaching, that makes me feel bad. And because it makes me feel bad, you're wrong. That's like no reason at all. To just, it makes me feel bad, so you're wrong. And I can probably sue you because you've hurt my feelings. And that's just insanity. But it's, it's where we've gone. The world doesn't want light doesn't want truth, doesn't really want Jesus. It wants the, the easy road. Comfort, wants to be told it's fine, doesn't want any, any moral code, I'll make that up for myself, thank you very much. And the consequences of it will be rough. Because, unfortunately, very often the only way we learn that we need God is when we're brought to our knees. So it's not something we wish on anyone, but the Lord has, has given us uh, a, a wonderful gift in our bodies and a wonderful gift in our sexual faculties to be used for the building up of his kingdom to be used for a sacred purpose we're called to so much more than, than people know and even in that aspect of our life we're called to live it as saints and it can be done, absolutely so we ask the good Lord today to heal our world of this obsession with sexuality and to put in its place a profound reverence for the human body, a profound love for each other, a profound understanding of our call in his sight to be the saints of our time. Amen.